Thanks for inviting me to speak here tonight. My subject involves four men with the last name of Burnham. All of them lived in Strawberry Vale for various periods of time. 12 years for one of them, 80 years for another, and so on. Strawberry Vale is a winding valley a couple of miles long, one end of which is in Portage Inlet to the south, the other end behind Whoop Road Jail on Interurban. I'll be telling the stories of these men, or rather snippets from their stories, some of which I was present to watch unfold. All of them happened between a half and a whole century ago. But unlike everything happening to me today, when time flashes by in a blur of events, those 50-year-old streams of memory still run clearly down the canyons of my mind and into my pools of recollection. I can therefore speak somewhat confidently about all four of these men, two brothers and one son from each brother, all four of whom attended Strawberry Vale's Little Red Schoolhouse on Hastings Street. The little red one-room building was the first of four Strawberry Vale classroom structures erected during the century-long building, demolition, and rebuilding plan. And like this one we're in now, here in Royal Oak, Strawberry Vale's first school was built in the 1890s. And like this one, it has survived the ravages of time and onslaught of well over a century of bad weather. It also survived the pressures of mindless demolition especially widespread during the 1960s when er anything old was bad and anything new was good. The approach then was to get rid of any building older than 50 years and to replace it with a building lasting only 25 years. Tops. The, the purpose of Strawberry Vale's little building, as it was for this one, was the education of children from grades one through eight with a maximum of about 35 students. The children, for the most part, came from parents owning farms in the surrounding areas. Apparently, life was good in Strawberry Vale, since people tended to remain in the valley and the surrounding uplands for more than one generation. In one case I know of, a total of four generations stayed here. As a result, Strawberry Vale School dragged in, often, I suspect, kicking and screaming, not only its first reluctant students, but subsequent generations as well. All no doubt found interest beyond the schoolyard in the workings of their parents' farms, or the candy counters of the local corner grocery stores, or the high-pitched whinings and thumpings of area chippo sawmills. Any in interest in the workings of school was confined to the anticipation of summer holidays, or the arrival of the critical age when one could legally quit the premises and go to work tilling the soil or harvesting the upland forests abounding nearby. One of those students whose idea of education was that it was a waste of valuable time later stood at the head of three more generations of Strawberry Vale school kids, some of them probably no more eager to attend the school than their patriarch himself had been. Now it's time to introduce the four Burnhams those alumni of Strawberry Vale School's Little Red Schoolhouse. There having been some 18 kids with the last name Burnham attending Strawberry Vale over the years, it became obvious I had to narrow the field. Thus we end up with four males, all of whom started their education in that little one-room building. The first person I want to introduce formally is me. I spent grades one and two in said place of learning before moving on to the big building, the one that had two rooms. <laughs> it may sound presumptuous of me to go first, and you might conclude that my ego is pretty big, which of course it is, and thereby places me into a position of some importance. But no, I'm acting as narrator for the others because I'm the only survivor of the four. Their stories, personal glimpses that I've had them, and of my own behavior, became part of me and can now only come from me. As an aside, I wasn't one of the students who dreaded being forced into the school scene. On the contrary, I, full of curiosity, climbed a few steps up to the school door, with zest, and willingly went in. There inside and before me 
stood my teacher, who well, obviously wasn't the tough bird of previous years that my older cousins and my sisters had warned me about. Instead, there was Miss Lindsay, no doubt fresh out of normal school. She was young, maybe still in her teens, perhaps, and pretty. I looked her over, it was love at first sight. <laughs> but never mind Miss Lindsay, back to talking about me. So hang on, number one of four coming up. My full name is Ronald Eugene Burnham. The first name probably was inspired by Ronald Coleman, the famous actor from Hollywood at the top of his form about the time I was born. Coleman has dis been described as suave, sophisticated, beloved. I don't know how di disappointed my parents were when it dawned on them that I wasn't going to achieve any of those qualities. My second name, Eugene, was inspired by my grandfather, the first Burnham, I'm sure, ever to come to Vancouver Island, firstly to Cobble Hill near Shawnigan Lake, and finally to Strawberry Vale. There are two dates offered by family members for the date of arrival of our grandfather with his family, one of them being 1906, the year Saanich Municipality was incorporated. If such is the case, did my grandfather's arrive in the district suggest a need for such official recognition for his new home? I think not. I recall my own father saying that his father, Eugene Burnham, arrived in Strawberry Vale with his family in 1909. My dad's birth certificate lists his birthplace as Cobble Hill, so I go with my, his dating of the family move to Strawberry Vale. My dad must have had early and powerful cognitive powers to remember such an event. He was two years old at the time. <laughs> Unhappily, Grandfather Eugene died in 1935, almost a year to the day before my own arrival in the world. His name, however, sur survives in my middle name and in that of my cousin Eleanor Eugenie Burnham. I'll start with the first of only a very few stories I recall that my father Ernest, known to all as Ernie, passed down to me. It was regarding his father. My dad said that Eugene must have left his home in Ontario under somewhat suspicious circumstances. And I gather he never talked to his children, or perhaps even the wife he had married in Cobble Hill, about his earlier life. The mystery deepened upon the arrival of a letter addressed to Eugene. It said that he had inherited a sum of money from a deceased relative in Ontario. All he needed to do was sign a letter with proof of who he was and the money would be sent out. He refused, not wanting to reconnect with relatives he hadn't seen in decades. I never heard what reason Grandfather gave to his family as they threw away the letter, but it must have been powerful indeed. It was like money being thrown into the flames of the kitchen stove. My dad must have nearly fainted. Oddly, since none of us Strawberry Vale knew anything of our undiscovered relatives in Ontario, a sudden, totally unexpected event happened. Not too many years ago, all of us of my generation of Burnham children received letters similar to that received by our grandfather decades before. The letters ask us to offer proof of our direct relationship to one Eugene Burnham, deceased in 1935. A grandniece of his had died without a will, and a detective firm was seeking out any first cousins of, those, of her who might still be alive. Those who could offer proof of such relationship with their great uncle were in line for an inheritance. It was smallest, it turned out, not the Scottish castle envisioned by my cousin Jack. The little windfall was welcome, of course, but the knowledge that Eugene's long-lost siblings, of whose existence my generation was totally unaware, was still flourishing in Ontario, was a much more significant factor for all of us. My father also told me early on, closer to home in Strawberry Vale, Grandfather Eugene had been built St. Columbus Church opposite Strawberry Vale Hall on Burnside Road. I knew that Eugene had made his life earnings with hand tools, having a couple of them in my possession, a block plane and a wedding stone for sharpening planes and chisels. 
But I always thought that my father might have been exaggerating just a little. That in fact his father probably made some of the pews, maybe the front steps. I was pleased to learn later, years later, however, when reading a column written by Sanic archivist Jeffrey Castle, that the church really had been built by my grandfather, along with his partner in the contracting firm of Burnham and Holmes. My wife and Sandra and I have a grandchild with the last name of Holmes Burnham, which is a bit of a coincidence. Okay, so my dad told it as it was. But of another of his stories, I never had doubt. That was his dog and moon episode. It seems that a dog owned by a family living at the north edge of the Hastings Street Flats, on the opposite side of the valley from the Burnham's farm, had followed Ernie's older brother Bill home one day. I don't know if this event was a result of the usual, hey mom, look what followed me home. Can we keep him? Or not, but the mutt seemed to want to stay. In any case, the dog was likely not encouraged by the, ch the boys to, to leave. Thus the pooch became a regular visitor, apparently enjoying the boys' company, and certainly vice versa. Until, one night of a full moon, the dog elected to sit directly below the upstairs window of the two boys' bedroom, whereupon he fixed his attention upon the lunar orb in the sky. Fearing somehow, perhaps, that the moon was coming to get him, get him and that it might be scared away by direct action on his part, the dog began to howl. And howl some more, never once taking his eyes off that threatening monster high in the sky. Bill got out of bed, went to and opened the bedroom window. He shouted down, telling the dog to shut up and go away. And it may have done so, obeying his new master's voice. Moments passed. More howling came up to the window. More shouting came down from it no sleeping by either party. So Bill, with Ernie's help, hoisted a small bedside table up to the open window and heaved it out. It fell, landing very near or on top of the fur furry disturber of the piece. With a crash and a yelp, the problem disappeared. The dog, probably thinking the moon had somehow stuck up, struck up behind him and pounced. In any case, the dog decided to head home. Not for long, he came back but probably not until the new, new moon presented a, a less fearsome appearance. But by now, the owners of the pooch were beginning to accuse the Burnhams of trying to steal their pet. This may or not have been true, but whatever, the dogs decided that avoiding trouble in the neighborhood meant discouraging the dog from coming over anymore. They tried chasing him away. He stood his ground down at the gate. They threw rocks. He stood his ground across the road and each time the dog snuck back into their yard as if he were coming home. The complaints from the hound's owners continued, so the boys made a terrible decision, not from any sense of malice, but from the need to end the problem once and for all. They invited the dog, the dog to come over with, to them, and Bill, with Ernie's help, tied a couple of soup tins on a string to the dog's tail. When they dropped the tin can onto the ground, the dog dropped the idea the Burnham's yard was a pleasant place to stay. <laughs> he was last seen and heard heading home for the last time. A couple of other Ernie stories. He told me that Eugene, when he was in his mid-80s, that he felt the end was coming, that he'd be dead within a couple of weeks. Ernie scoffed. His father had years left. But two weeks later, Eugene indeed was gone. A month after that, his wife was also gone. The other story, one I found to be a trifle too unlikely, was that our distant ancestor brought himself and the Burnham name from England to North America on the good ship Mayflower in 1620. As time went on, I had even less faith in my dad's story. It really came home to me as a fable when an American com commentator remarked years later that the Mayfar must have been one big ship. <laughs> Gigantic, in fact. To have on board the ancestors of practically every American living in the 20th century. Well, I thought maybe the ship was really big. Really, really big. So gigantic, in fact, as to make the Titanic look like a harbor tug. 
I looked up a picture of the Mayflower the other day in my encyclopedia. The sailing ship looked indeed to be not much bigger than one of the Titanic's limited number of lifeboats. Okay, not that many ancestors could have bored, come crowded into that small space. Nevertheless, once again, my father's story, story turned out to have some validity. During a search some years ago of the Burnham name by a local Victorian, Victoria historian, also named Burnham, and I'm sorry to say I can't remember his first name, revealed, in fact, that two brothers named Burnham arrived in New York at about the time of the Mayflower sailing some 400 years ago. This historian also uncovered the origin of the Burnham name, and that all Burnhams now living are directly related to one man. That gentleman, a Norman from France, arrived in England as an aide to William the Conqueror, and was a significant participant in the Battle of Hastings, a battle that all altered the politics and future of that country. The story goes that said Burnham was rewarded for his efforts in the battle by his superior William with a grant of a considerable amount of land up the coast from Hastings. I understand his adopted name came from old English words for water and town or something like that. The survival of his name for nearly a thousand years gives me pause. There must have been a lot of Burnhams with the name intact to have enough left over after plagues endless wars, family squabbles, pestilence, and politics to procreate and carry on. It turns out that Eugene wasn't the only Burnham working with wood. Although my father chose farming as a way of earning a living, his older brother Bill, after stints as the teamster, a driver of horse-drawn vehicles in this case, and as fireman on a steam logging locomotive, he eventually became a logger and lumberman. Although perhaps this occupation wasn't as scary as riding, for instance, in a locomotive when it lost control of its long load of logs on a hill leading down to the log dump on Shawnigan Lake, it continued at a fast pace out onto the log dump trestle, heading for a swim in the lake. As a kind of miracle, I suppose, but typical of, of Bill's never-say-die lifestyle, the engineer and his crew were able to put, get the train stopped just short of falling off the end of the trestle. I doubt if that near miss was enough to make Bill choose another field of endeavor. He was fearless. No doubt it took other circumstances, like the destruction of, by fire of the mill across the Stronigan Lake. Now there was no need for logs and no need for a steam train a situation likely to influence his decision to move back to Strawberry Vale. From there, he embarked on buying up timbered acreages, harvesting the trees, setting up his mill, and cutting rough lumber. One of the places he set up his operation was right outside our house, in our own yard. As a six-year-old curious kid, I was amazed by the mill's operation. Logs were rolled by a one-man powered PV from the loading ramp onto the carriage that accepted them one by one. After my uncle had fastened the log onto the carriage with dogs, pointy things that slid down rails and dug into the wood, he would accelerate the mill's ancient car engine to full throttle by a cord running from his left hand to his en the engine's carburetor. With his right hand, he would push the handle that caused pulleys to pull the carriage back and forth, feeding the log through the big head saw. At first bite, the log of the log by the whirring, whining head saw, the ancient engine would slow down, droning, complaining of the load. I worried the engine was about to die a painful death, and die it did, along with another such engine at the engine desk at the hand of the man at the helm. After taking off all the merchantable timber off our property, which I later discovered was really his property, Uncle Bill moved next door to another five-acre parcel on Charlton Road to the eventual graveyard of all those engines. I visited this new mill site often, continuing to stand by, out of range of flying engine parts, to watch with fascination as engine after engine bit the dust, so to speak. Well, not so to speak. They had broken engines, often with pistons hanging out of their sides, like the tongues of exhausted dogs, were dropped without ceremony into any piece of ground that wasn't in the way. It wasn't that Bill intended to be a mass murderer of mill engines. 
These were the years of World War II when all production of North American car manufacturers went into the war effort. Nothing of automotive manufacture was available to the general public, and that included Jippo sawmill operators. No cars, trucks, or engines. And needless to say, no imported cars from Japan or Germany were failing in the void. Who knew what winning that war would bring? In any case, Bill was left to scrounge any ancient and cast off engines that he could get running. Unfortunately, the supplier of those engines would be a local junkyard. Like Cameron's on Craigflower Road, who had large selections of cars that had been brought to this vast yard. And they were there for the most part because they were totally worn out. But if anyone could get them started, Bill could and did. They never lasted long on service, a few weeks, a few days, a few hours. But the high turnover of those power plants acquainted me with the names of many of those car makers who had ceased to exist with, after the oncoming Great Depression of 1929 to 1939. Hupmobiles, Stars, Moons, Jewetts, Auburns, Franklin Air Cools, Essex Super Sixes. I watched their arrival and even on occasion accompanied, accompanied those engines as they were brought from the Cameron or Jack Douglas junkyards to the Charlton Road site. Not long afterwards, I'd watch their departures into the surrounding bush. Although not often present when the water jacket, say, of a water, uh, Hudson flew off into space, the whining saw slowing to a whimper before the deadest of silences, my trips down to watch the mill might get sight of a hotmobile's transmission lying in the dirt awaiting burial. As I said, Uncle Bill was fearless. One day while I was watching at the helm of the clanking, roaring, and spinning apparatus of the saw arbor, his pant leg was grabbed by a turning shaft. The cloth immediately t started to tear, whipping around and around, winding up as it tore ever higher up his leg. The well-worn and aging denim of his trousers probably saved his life, since otherwise he would likely have been thrown into the works and crushed. Unimpressed by this turn of events, Bill let go of the carriage operating handle, which immediately stopped the action. Calmly taking out his pocket knife, he severed the pant leg and threw it aside. For the rest of the day, he stood at his post, pushing the handle back and forth, yanking the carburetor cord, oblivious to any sawdusty grass stealing up his bare leg. The next day when I went down to the mill, I saw that a screen had been installed to protect the Sawyer from his equipment. Mill work was dangerous, my dad once told me, probably from his own experiences while being employed for a time at a downtown sawmill. I could see now that what he meant. I also remembered Lorne Butt, a marvelous will millwright able to hold heavy timbers with the stub of his long before severed arm as he made and hung the cutoff saw arbor at my uncle's mill. By this time following the war, my cousin Art, Bill's son, the fourth member of, the quartet of, Bur of this quartet of Burnham's, worked with his father at the mill. The shortage of engines from the war efforts had yet to be filled, and somehow Bill made a deal with Saanich Municipality to buy a huge, single-cylindered, double-flywheel diesel engine, once the power plant of a rock crusher. It was duly hauled to the mill and installed in place in, in the engine pit. The compression of that single cylinder, which was something like a foot in diameter, or 30 centimeters, was so great that it required a car engine to get the big flywheels to spinning fast enough to be able to slam shut the relief air valve and kick the engine into life. Sometimes it took several tries. Then with a pounding noise that shook the ground, a single smoke ring would fly up from the top of the vertical exhaust pipe each time after several rotations of the big flywheels, the smoke ring signal in the beginning of the Sawyer's workday, and that of my cousin Art at his cutoff saw. On a clear day from the playing fields of Mount View High School, four miles away, I could hear the rolling thump of each firing of the great engine. Sadly, that machine, although powerful, was too slow for turning the saw at optimum speed. It was replaced by a Buddha, I think the name was. And it was a diesel engine, but like all the other poor car engines, had problems too. It had a tendency to overheat, 
and one day it got so hard it began to diesel, which I understand means that it no longer cared about accelerators or cooling systems or ignition switches or automated sh shutoffs or anything like that. In a huff it took off. Increasing, increasing its speed, faster and faster, till the two lumbermen felt it was going to fly to pieces in a diesel-filled explosion. Bill jumped down into the engine well, and as Art told me, started fiddling with the fuel line with a wrench. Art himself had other ideas. Grabbing the mill's fire axe, he leaped into the pit and with a single chop severed the fuel line. The Buddha rolled into a silence similar to that offered by the stars and the moons, and the Jewetts, and the Hudsons, the Franklin Air Cools. The Buddha was never the same after that, I was told. Cousin Art was like his father, quick with mechanical things. Even driving at age 10, his father's wood truck, delivering cutoff saw wood for area wood stoves and fireplace customers. By the time he was legally allowed to drive at age 16, he had already had six years of accident-free driving to his credit. So it was natural that when in the 1950s sawdust-burning kitchen stoves became popular, but his dad brought him a little one-ton Model A Ford dump truck, complete with high sides for large but relatively light sod loads of sawdust. He did these deliveries in the evenings after his eight-hour shift at the cutoff saw. I happened to be with him in the cab of the little truck as we drove into the mill site early one summer evening. Driving around to the back of the mill, Hart backed the little Ford under the sawdust bunker, ready to load up. The bunker was a large roof box on stilts. Sawdust from the head saw was moved up by conveyor belt to the window at the top of the bunker, ready for delivery. When Hart received another order for the sawdust, he'd climb up into the box, open a trap door, and push the sawdust down into the truck with a scoop shovel. That evening, I stood down in the pit below and watched the magic of sawdust falling like a yellow blizzard. Hey Ronnie, he called down, can you back the truck up a few feet? It's piling up at the back. Now then, quandary. Do I admit I'd never in my life driven anything more than mechanical in a wheelbarrow? No. Here I was already 12 years old, two years older than Art was when he already was out driving his dad's wood truck. I was too ashamed to admit my retardation. Art had already been a little scornful after I'd told him I wanted to go to high school instead of doing something productive, like working, such as he had been doing when driving a tractor, tilling potatoes instead of attending grade seven in school. I could see he was already concerned about me. Four years in high school. The look on his face told it all. Nope. Time to redeem myself. I got into the truck and sat behind the wheel. It wasn't as if I didn't know how the thing worked. I'd studied every movement my father made while driving our Jewett touring car and later our Auburn straight eight. Key on, starter pushed, engine running, clutch in, reverse, just like it said on the symbol set on the gear shift knob. Accelerator depressed, rev up, clutch out, movement, lift off. There'd be nothing to it, right? I started the count, count down to reversing. Engine running, gear selected, handbrake off, clutch out. The little car lurched into action, roaring backwards at speed and colliding with the stilts of the rear of the bunker. The truck stalled. The bunker swayed frighteningly, its spindly legs rocking and twisting back and forth. The sawdust shoveler yelled. I cringed. Mark climbed down out of the bunker came to the driver's window of the truck and motioned me to get out. He never said anything to me as he climbed in, starred the truck and moved it ahead a few feet. But I could tell he was terribly disappointed in me. It was impress his impression of me that lasted for a long time, for both of us. Several years later, he happened to ask if I was still going to high school. I nodded yes. He shook his head sadly. And so, thus ends my presentation of four Strawberry Vale students, four who attended classes in a little red schoolhouse that still remains on its original site on Hastings Street, although now it stands on the opposite corner of the property from where, where we four entered its hallowed halls. Thank you. If I have the answers, yes. <laughs>
there were some good characters out your way. Yes. Well, <laughs> there are some, and I. This is off the cuff. On a on a road off the road there behind the jail. There was a painted Fortson tractor, and it had been all painted nice and red, and the word sugar was painted on the side of the of the vehicle. And the story was it was called sugar because he had uh, visited this man's wife up on the street. And while he was thus engaged, the owner came home, saw the tractor, filled it a gas tank full of sugar, <laughs> and re left. And having finished his visit, came out, jumped aboard the tractor, and roared down the hill. By the time he got to the bottom, the thing, of course, had seized up completely. Thereupon, the owner, or the, the uh, chagrined uh, husband, painted it bright red and wrote, <laughs> and it's, Stayed there for years afterwards. <laughs> His brother went to school with my dad. He ran a dairy um, at the corner, and after he had passed on, uh, inherited the property, which of course had been their parents' property originally. And I always had a running battle with with Santa, it's municipality. It was typical of him to let the taxes lap till the day before he was going to lose the property tax, possible tax. He'd rush in with the cash <laughs> and then another four years would pass, or another, by next year, another four years had accumulated and so on. When Santa wanted to widen the road, they had this row of poplar trees that were in the way and so they, assuming that it was on the road right away, they cut them all down. He appears, by the way, those were actually on the property line, and my father, you know, a pioneer in the district, planted those trees. Oh, so I figured at $500 a tree, <laughs> you owe me something. <laughs> and he settled. He wanted to develop the property because across Interurban Road, there was a uh, subdivision finished for townhouses, said he was the big farm, he would do the same. So he went to Saanich and they said, no, nope, there's enough townhouses in the district. So he said, oh, okay, well. He went away, but it, his land was de still declared as farmland. So he piled a pile of manure 20 feet high on the property, <laughs> which must have really made the owners of the condominiums across the road very happy when the north wind blew from his direction. Which brings up another story <laughs> about them. Um, at one time they owned the business in, in Saanich. And uh, Saanich, in their wisdom, decided that they could run a better operation than So he made a deal with them to sell all his equipment. <laughs> to them, which was timely for me, but not for Saanich, because apparently it was just one huge pile of junk. <laughs> Always came out on top. Smart guy. Smart. Thank you, Ron. That's great. Thank you. Thank you.